Gustavo Tormentosa, the Cape of Storms, so called in 1488 by the navigator Bartholomew Diaz, later renamed by King John III of Portugal as the Cape of Good Hope, a place where journeys begin and end. It is this dark bastion at the southern tip of Africa which divides the warm Indian Ocean from the wide, cold reaches of the South Atlantic. This is a place of legend. These are the waters where the flying Dutchman sails, condemned to beat out an eternity against the storms of time. A place where things may still be done by man, if he has the head and heart to see them through. Today, the wind is light and the ocean leaden, heavy, as if both wind and water, though spent of effort, remain unwilling to give up this man in his tiny vessel, whom they have tested to the very limits of natural rage. Beyond the Cape now, the little boat points north, up towards the safety of Table Bay, towards the conclusion of one of mankind's great voyages. Suddenly, he is no longer alone. His tiny boat is dwarfed by the welcoming fleet. When those boats started coming out, I actually tried to ignore them. I don't really know why. And I couldn't understand why they would come out. I mean, <laughs> he's interested in the man and on the wooden open boats. Saturday, the 13th of March, 1993. The sailor returns to his point of departure. Cape Town Harbour has seen the passage of thousands of great sailing ships. Thermopylae, Cutty Sark and Fiery Cross, Moshulu, Archibald Russell and Law Hill. All here, perhaps, as ghosts, with all their sailors in their yards to cheer the arrival of the little ship which has inherited their water and their wind. His voyage, alone in an open boat, has taken him round the world. It has never been done, till now. The man is Anthony Stewart. This is his story. I'll never forget this poem that I, I did learn at school. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake to find that all was vanity. But those who dream by day are dangerous men, for they live to make their dreams come possible. My whole life I've been surrounded by people who want to do things but found a reason not to. When I was a kid, I decided, well, I'm not going to be that type of person. I'm going to go out there and do it. Ant Stewart's story starts far from the sea in the landlocked interior. I grew up in the middle of South Africa, farming country, but I was very lucky. I was, our house was on the shores of a dam, and um, every day that I could, I went sailing. My inspiration about the ocean was just reading about the people, the famous people who had crossed oceans and the places they'd been to. And I was very fortunate that we finally moved down to the sea, and uh, I got the opportunity to sail on the ocean and go to places that I dreamed about, read about. The dream takes shape, to succeed where others have failed, in the last of the sea's great challenges, to sail around the world alone in an undecked open boat, from Cape Town via St. Helena and Ascension to the Caribbean, from Panama to Polynesia and on to Australia, through the Timor Sea and the Indian Ocean, and then home down over the Agullas Bank, the most dangerous waters in the world, all this in a tiny open vessel less than 20 feet in length. The size of Ant Stewart's boat is determined by the lightness of his pocket, 
The basic design is that of a 19-foot day sailor from the board of designer Dudley Dix. Anthony uh, came to me really after having bought the boat. Uh, Ant went to the boat builders and said he'd like to buy the plug, which they sold to him, and then afterwards he said he was going to sail around the world on this boat. And uh, I was horrified because it was very, very lightly built, not intended as a structural boat. And uh, Ant then went about fitting out the boat, putting in lots of watertight bulkheads and so on to get it up to the strength that would be required for him to do the job. The fitting out of the little hull took place in Ant Stewart's small apartment in District 6 in the heart of Cape Town. Finally, halfway through the building process, I was asked to leave because I was making too much noise in a residential area. So <laughs> I basically got evicted. The boat is built to the severest of budgets. The buoyancy in the bow is polystyrene, taped up in household garbage bags. The ballast keel is cast by friends in their back garden. Yet none of these and other desperate economies prejudices the integrity of the boat. Public at last, it represents such a radical idea that it whips up a storm of controversy in the sailing community. I always found that the worst critics were the so-called yachting or sailing experts. Actually, the odds were 50 to 1 that I wouldn't make the first island. But I actually laughed at them because I knew in my mind that I would make it. The 18th of February, 1991, the man and his boat are as ready as they ever will be. But the intended departure date coincides with a typical Cape southeasterly gale. What does the port captain say about you leaving the port? Uh, the port captain's been very easy about it uh, so far. He has had one call from an R8 citizen who's worried about myself getting shipwrecked and then the government having to pay the bill. But um, I've signed a form saying that uh, I want no rescue whatsoever. When I left Cape Town, the wind held for about three hours, I remember, and suddenly the wind just died. There was nothing, it was flat calm. And I looked, I was pretty close to shore, and I looked over there, and friends of mine who live right on the beach, I could see them going about their daily lives. It was starting to get dark, they were turning on the lights. I was probably watching TV, and uh, I felt quite devastated because I suddenly realised that I was a sailing away from my life, and when I'd come back, it would be a new life. I was leaving everything that I knew, knowing that I would never come back to what it was. His first setback is almost immediate. He loses his charts, the very basis of exact navigation. I ran around and compiled a whole lot of charts that people gave to me. Five days later, those charts were useless. They were just complete pulp. And the only thing that I had left was a school atlas. <laughs> if Columbus could have discovered America with very little navigation means, why can't I go around the world with a school atlas? The South Atlantic is an unforgiving place. Here, the north-flowing Benguela current is icy cold and the weather invariably temperamental, always less than kind. My first capsize was five days out of Cape Town. I was off the coast of Southwest Africa, Namibia. Those first five days I hadn't slept at all really, just brief naps because I still wasn't into this whole voyage. The Atlantic does not intend to treat him well. He will suffer regular knockdowns. He will be forced to jettison his dangerously rusted gas cylinder. A diet of raw fish will lead to serious food poisoning and he will drift in a delirium for several days. His Atlantic crossing, 5,500 nautical miles, will take 52 days. Barbados, most westerly of the Windward Islands, guardian at the gate of the Caribbean. He reprovisions here, then sails northwest up through the necklace of the Lesser Antilles to St. Martin, and from there, west-southwest to Panama. The Caribbean is a busy place, a messy cat's cradle of sea routes funneling down to the Panama Canal. For a solo sailor in a tiny engineless boat, this is the stuff of nightmares. Approaching Panama, when I fell asleep, after being totally exhausted, 
I was basically run down by a ship. The bow wave pushed me out. I don't remember what happened at all. I was asleep. Next thing I was covered in water, and this black moving object was moving past me. The Pacific Ocean waits for him. 9,000 miles is too great to cross all at once, and he breaks the journey at the islands of Galapagos and the Marquesas, then sails on through Polynesia. He must reach Darwin in northern Australia before the hurricane season breaks. That at least is the plan. With time against him, each leg through this supposed paradise is a test of his inner strength. There's many times that I wanted to give up. Each leg was, in many ways, a struggle. I mean, I had one or two legs between islands which were really pleasant and an absolute dream. But I think virtually every leg, there was some point in time when the conditions were really terrible, when the salt sores were getting to me when I couldn't sit down. The water, salt water just breaking all over the boat. You can take so much and I'd want to give up. But the fury of the storm is nothing compared with burning, windless days. When you become, you just pray for a storm because a storm is something you can live with. You know, maybe it's fear factor, but it's something happening around you. But to be becalmed is the most frustrating experience anyone can go through. It's sheer frustration. You're powerless. Powerless in a different way when confronted by the sea's compelling beauty in the crystal safety of island reefs or at points in the deep, deep ocean further from land than any other place on Earth. It's, I mean, the absolute pleasure of being able to think uninterrupted and to dream uninterrupted and just to, to think things out unaffected by the surroundings. No entertainment could equal that. No movie, no disco. I suppose it's a sort of meditation, and uh, I used to look forward to it. And I would hate the interruption of having to suddenly prepare a meal, or, or trim the sail, or reef the sail. I would just want to carry on thinking about whatever I was. I'd be mostly involved with it. Leaving Pago Pago in American Samoa, bound for the Timor Sea, his mast, weakened by countless knockdowns, is no match for the cruel strength of a sudden rain squall. Returning to Samoa, he sets up a jury rig. Under a lash-up of boom and spinnaker pole, he sails 2,300 miles to Brisbane, where he will be able to make a proper repair. He sets sail again, up through the Great Barrier Reef, into the Timor Sea, and into the Indian Ocean. It is his intention now to make the longest open boat passage in sailing history, from Darwin to Durban, more than 6,000 nautical miles. A new video camera is the sole witness to this solitary life, cramped, wet, exposed. If you live in a city, I can see how you can suffer loneliness, but on the sea you can never be lonely if you belong there. Too many people sail for the wrong reason and they suffer terrible loneliness. And these are the stories you hear about. But the real sad is people who love the sea never get lonely. And uh, I cannot recall one day in my whole sailing time, 260 days at sea, that I was actually ever lonely at sea. Oh, the song's pretty good, it's pretty relevant. Tell he has an easy confidence now in his ability and in the integrity of his boat. It's as if he has made a pact with the natural world. He's no longer in awe of the water and the wind. He reached the sea, and I'm still half human. <laughs> I haven't changed much. Um, as you can see, the wind's very calm. Uh, I've done 2,100 miles, or just over. Today it was a very bad run, but what can you do? But, um, I'm slip. I've got 1,500 to go to the Moors. So, not too bad. You can see, and I'm still alive. Uh, need to shave a bit, but I uh, can't afford the razors. <laughs>
playing all night like this. Doesn't look like it though. 52 degrees east, 9 degrees south. North of Madagascar to windward of the Providence Islands. The wrath of the Indian Ocean rips the rig out of his boat and five frightening days and nights of storm follow. Force eight and above. In his path lies the uninhabited sandbar known as Surf Island. There is no avoiding the inevitable. Suddenly, there is water everywhere. There are sharks in the storm-battered lagoon. He hits out at them with a marlin spike. I wasn't ready to die when I saw that reef. I didn't want to die. There was so much still to do. And I thought it was unfair. I wanted to finish the voyage. Once I decided that I couldn't get away from the reef, well, I just accepted it. The winds subside. The damage is total. Of the stranded boat, nothing but the hull remains. There is little to salvage, and worse still, contact with the outside world is impossible, for the emergency radio beacon is corroded beyond repair. He is totally alone. The island will feed him pawpaws, coconuts, and crabs, and the video camera, charged from the solar panels of the wreck, gives him a sense of contact with his family. Well, my second day recovered a bit, feel a little bit better. And I've got it day and I can't remember what day it is. But anyway, it's the uninhabited island. I think it's Alphonse. Um, I just hope they find me soon because I'm worried about my mum and dad. What can I say? And then Sue, I know she'll be going through hell. That's the worst, worst thing about what I do. Okay. Nine days later, Ant is rescued by fishermen from nearby Farquhar Island and he manages to hitch a ride home. Jan Smuts Airport, Johannesburg, the 18th of August, 1992. Ant comes home, barefoot, broke, but not broken. Home to the people whose love he has carried around the world, his mother, father, and childhood sweetheart, Sue. The same good fortune which brought Ant home brought back his boat. The fisherman who rescued him returned to Surf Island and retrieved NCS Challenger. They had wrapped the abandoned hull in a fishing net and towed it 450 miles to Mahe in the Seychelles. Their explanation? We are sailors, so is he, and this is his boat. From Mahe the wreck was shipped home to be rebuilt, the old boat made new improved by the knowledge gained over 23,000 miles at sea. The area that, the boat's 90 foot, but the area that I live in is seven foot by three foot, and basically that's the sum total where I can move about in this boat. I don't go up front because it's too dangerous. I don't have the guardrails to protect me, so I've got to stay here and keep low down so I don't fall overboard. This is um, my basic sleeping arrangement where I'll I'll sleep when I need sleep. As you can see, I fit in very tightly, so if the boat does capsize, I can keep myself pinned in without falling out. Which uh, has worked so far. <laughs> Diego Suarez, Madagascar. The Sandra S. weighs anchor. Bound for the Comores, she has agreed to drop Ant to windward of Surf to pick up his track. Ah, hello. Come on, wake up. Maybe this will help. The 23rd of November, 1992. The Sandra S reaches a point southeast of Surf. By sailing north, Ant will cross the path of his storm-wracked drift. It's hard to explain to people what you actually go through out there, being totally exposed and 
Yeah, I mean, I must admit, I'm really nervous. I mean, I'm going back to area where I nearly lost my life. So I'm pretty nervous about going back and uh, being cycling season already. Uh, I mean, I, I am scared. At midnight, the launch in a deep sea swell is not easy. A mistake made now will put an end to the dream. Into the water, into the darkness. Too late for second thoughts. With the coming of dawn, a serious leak develops in the sealed rear chamber. Rather than return to Madagascar, he sails on 450 miles to Mayotte, bailing constantly through a saucer-sized aperture too small for anything larger than a mug. So what I did was build a wall around you and just bail like hell, and I finally won the battle. I must have bailed out about 200 liters of water. It's a little bit frightening. Leaving the Comores is difficult. He has been given nothing but help, shown nothing but kindness. Sailing south now in the Mozambique Channel, the Finns belong to neither dolphin nor shark, but Orca orchinus, the killer whale. <laughs> it's pretty nerve-wracking when you get a, a killer whale. I mean, the guy was any of the length of my boat. Ant Stewart works his way down the coast, bite by bite. Caution is best for the thousand miles that still stand between him and the end of his journey across the Agalas Bank are considered to be the most dangerous in the world. The only truth, the dream of you, haunts me more than most. Mast had high, my dream birds fly silently as ghosts. The moon drinks up my soul by night, the sun strips off my skin, and I can find no ending but the place where I begin. The only truth, the dreams of you, so easily all lost. They disappear, replaced by fear, if you wait to count the cost. The truth of life cuts like a knife Where the water meets the wind My life is fixed somewhere betwixt The water and the wind Oh man, crazy, the white back way You will seize the day Love me more than ghosts. The moon drinks up my soul by night. The sun strips off my skin. And I can find no ending but the place where I begin. He's got that one thing that he's done that no one can take away from him the personal satisfaction of achieving his own little goal. Actually, it's not such a little goal, it's quite a big goal. What has he done? I mean, he's had a very nice time. He's seen places he would not normally see. He's lived in solitude. He's uh, enjoyed himself. He's experienced fear. He's experienced risk. And when he lies in the bed, he's going to say, have I done everything I want to do? Have I done everything? Have I enjoyed it? I bet his answer will be yes. Single-handed sailing has got to be the most selfish thing that a person can do. You basically deny the rights of other people, rights that they have to you, your family, your wife. And I'm very aware of this selfishness, but it's something that I have to do. I have to go away to be alone. You come back more compassionate, more considerate. To realize the fact that I could die out there is something 
that I hope my wife could live with and understand that it was something I had to do 